This is The Chris Abraham Show. Hey there, this is Season 7, Episode 1 of The Chris Abraham Show. My name is Chris Abraham, and I'm going to endeavor to make a good Happy New Year recording, although I have nothing to guarantee it. And it's basically sort of like crepe making, right? With with crepe making, the first couple crepes are crap until you get the, you know, and hey, hey, until you get the uh, the heat and the pan and the flame level and the pouring, everything sorted out. The first crepe is generally uh, misshapen and has too much butter on it. I mean, it's a delicious crepe. I'm hoping this will be a delicious crepe, but it won't be a well-formed crepe. Although none of my podcast episodes are well-formed crepes. And this one is going to be funny because I started recording when I closed my front door of my apartment. And so I'm going to be doing a lot of like silence skipping based on whether or not there's someone around me. Happy New Year's all y'all. This is Chris Abraham, brand new season, season seven of the Chris Abraham show. And we'll see how this goes. I meant today to be a housekeeping day, but I have a lot of things to do with regards to responding for interview requests and an interview at three and uh and a little bit of work and a little bit of follow through and maybe some website updates and that kind of deal so i thought i might as well turn today into a work day uh besides i am going through a little bit of afib today and what that means to me is that i'm a little bummed so when i'm bummed i'm uh hey when i'm bummed i prefer to kind of get work done like work to me is a little bit like uh, meditation, maybe? I don't know. It is warm enough not to have a jacket, but cold enough to put on my beanie hat slash watcher cap. So that's what I'm doing. And uh, it's sunny. It's pretty. The D.C. area is sunny a lot. Like, I think that in the same way that New York and, uh, well, New York can't tell if it's nice out because the entire world is blocked by buildings. But The DMV, the D.C. area, is oftentimes very uh, temperate and very sunny. Uh, We're not a rainy city. When my mom lived in Fort Lauderdale, it would storm every afternoon. Uh, London is known for London fog. We get really good fogs here, but only periodically. All right, season seven. uh, Totally not notable. Not notable at all. And the news things, like... You know, the uh, issues with uh, issues with plagiarism and issues with all kinds of things, issues with plagiarism, issues with none of it matters. I'm even I'm even losing interest in uh, Emma Chamberlain, although it was fun to kind of go all the way back to her first videos uh, when she was 16 and see her interact in her all girls school her all-girls Catholic school called, like, uh, uh, Notre Dame, Notre Dame, maybe. Anyway, um, it was amazing to watch her. She has an amazing amount of charisma and boldness and fearlessness, and it's really infectious. And I feel like the reason why I'm so besotted, besotten by her is that I'm, like, projecting myself onto her. Like, she went to all girls Catholic school. I went to an all boys Catholic school. She's an only child. I'm an only child. Um, that's it. But, um, I feel like everybody who knows me believes me to be a bit of a goofus, a bit of a dork, and not a dork in terms of someone who plays D and D, but someone who is a clown, but not a clown who eventually becomes a, uh, a stand-up comedian but a clown who just says dumb shit, right? Like, I think maybe I'm that guy, and 
I've been told that that's a coping mechanism or defensive strategy because I am six foot two now. I was six foot three. And I think my dad was lying about being six foot four because I never felt like he was a very big man. Um, but yeah, I feel like it was always a, a strategy growing up in Hawaii because like I'm a foot, a foot taller than most of my friends. Uh, and, uh, and I think like being in Hawaii, I was always trying to make people like me. Like I used to be, I used to pretend that I was into popping and locking and hip hop and, and salt and pepper and uh, all that other stuff. And I used to draw, if you're old enough, you'll remember back in the 80s, people used to draw these like popper locker, like cartoons where there was just clothes and feet and hands and hats. And you kind of like drew the big bubbly words, you know, like the big bubble words and that kind of deal. And like, I feel like in intermediate school, that's what I did in order to make people think that I like could fit in. And I feel that desire to, uh, I don't know, awkwardly, because you don't have the experience of growing up with brothers and sisters and uh, you don't really have any reaction except the reaction of other adults or of adults. And that even if you hang out with cousins and stuff, it's, uh, at least for me, it's not like normalized. Like we didn't, I never had, because my parents moved me to Hawaii when it, by the time I was six, I really didn't have the experience of, uh, of growing up with cousins and uncles and aunts and stuff like that. So it was only people I knew. And so things like physical touch or hugging or like, I saw a, a brother and sister hug and they totally like mushed into each other and put their hands in each other's hair, kind of like a real, like close hug that is so intimate that I almost wanted to turn away. It wasn't a sexy thing, but like, I think that all of my relationships with my friends have been more formalistic or more formal or less, uh, more aware of personal space. Right, like even now with my best friends, I would never do a drop over. I would never do a pop in. I would schedule something, put it on the calendar, make sure I remind them. I treat all of my relationships, even my former relationships, pretty much, except maybe Mark, treat them like uh, they're business meetings. You know what I mean? Jelly bean. Anyway, uh, I'm a little gimpy today. Freaking pisses me off. Ah. Uh, Come on, leg. You've been doing so good. Maybe I need to move someplace that has, like, you know how, like, old people move to the south so that it's uh, less cold out? Well, maybe that's, like, my vibe. Maybe that's what I'm going to do is move to Arizona because of the, because of the, uh, I don't know, because of the joints, because of the, the body aches, because of the arthritis, maybe. I don't know. Be cute. So I have been uh, flirting with moving to Jacksonville, Florida. So if any of you guys know Jacksonville, I don't know why Jacksonville. I'm just like, why not Florida? But definitely not Florida, but not like Southern Florida and certainly not Tampa or, or uh, that awful place where all the theme parks are, Orlando, no Gulf Florida. I want Atlantic Ocean, Florida. So I don't know. Uh, what else? Aha, look at that. I forgot my cell phone at home, so I have to go back because I can't live without my cell phone today. It's so annoying. Anyway, that'll mean that it'll be a longer episode because I was going to drone on until, uh, until I got to Ideto's for a coffee. So I have to walk all the way back to the apartment because I stupidly left my phone there a Galaxy S22 Ultra because I'm a garbage person. After hearing that, so tempted to put a second phone on my line and make it like uh, an iPhone 14 or something, just so that I could return to the world of FaceTimes and, uh, and uh, iOS, iPhone Messenger, and all the other special things that the cool kids do. And that if you're a funny colored bubble or if you're not on the network, it's similar to back in the day when it was all about BlackBerry Messenger and everybody had BlackBerry Messenger. 
And if you didn't have BlackBerry Messenger, even if you used SMS, you were outside of the group. So you needed to spend big bucks on getting a BlackBerry. It's very similar to what's going on with, uh, with iPhone, I guess. Um, I guess the latest news is that I've become obsessed with tin fish again. So I am probably giving myself this tummy ache. Nobody to blame but myself. Also, I started on the first or maybe the second, I started the virtual team challenge and I'm still on the Potomac Boat Club virtual indoor rowing team, even though I'm pretty sure I'm not a member there anymore. Oh, I haven't been there in years. It's like so sad. I've also stopped going to Park Run because I was doing so well with regards to going back to the gym that I kind of want to focus on that for a while and uh, just make sure I got my knees and my hammies and my quads back to pre-elderly shape. And uh, getting on the erg is an important part of that. Um, the erg does an amazing job of helping me str uh, straighten my legs and stretch my legs and run my knees at full extension and contraction. And uh, also it's something that once I get accustomed to it, I can do 10,000 meters every day and pretty much slowly, like Maffetone speed, except for high intensity power 10s and power 20s. And I feel like that's my vibe. My vibe is slow, but steady for long. And then uh, once in a while, like I usually do it during, uh, I torture myself during uh, commercials. I generally watch TVs and movies since everything has, uh, commercial breaks in the lower end can rationalize paying extra for no commercials like my time's not that valuable because i can I, I have the kind of adhd where i can uh i can have tv on in the background and it doesn't distract me because i hyper focus which is a big problem because i can hyper focus my way out of an entire program and then luckily since they're streaming i can rewind them all the way back to the beginning so no harm no foul uh, did I say foul? Foul? Foul. F-O-U-L versus F-O-W-L. So I'm sitting on a bench, bench, on a bench now, a decrepit old wooden bench here, and I am trying to stretch out my right leg hamstring because I feel like that, I feel like my, um, hamstring flexibility and my, uh, glute gluteus maximus uh flexibility my entire if you will my entire uh what is it called uh not pectoral uh my entire chain that includes the lower back the glutes and the hamstrings that would be you know the word uh, not dorsal not pectoral not uh can't even check my phone because I haven't, re I need to return and go get it. So re thanks for reminding me. So yeah, so I think it's fascinating to listen and watch Emma Chamberlain. Like I will call it uh, PNR, pre-nose ring. You know what I mean? When she was saying frick instead of fuck. And she says frick and she says fuck a lot. And I believe that when she was 16 and 17, she was a force of nature that was completely unaware of her power like a like a um a puppy rottweiler but i feel like at some point she became self-aware and her self-awareness uh where she started looking at herself in the mirror and being self-aware and having a uh, uh, youtube object permanence and being t having her own coffee company and all these other things i feel like that is a different that is uh P N R post nose nose ring or A N R opre uh, opre nose ring, but I like those too. I mean, the ones that are one or two years old, I don't know. Uh, a lot of them aren't playful puppy anymore. A lot of those are uh, business decisions, and uh, I realized that in the last year or so, she's given up YouTube, and I have no desire to listen to her on uh on a podcast primarily because she's a 
physical actor. She's like Lucille Ball. Um, she is a physical comedian, and you need to see her like lazy eye. You need to see her um, aping to the to the camera. You need to see her um, uh, primitive though perfectly beautiful edits and. Uh, I guess they're called, what are they called? Um, uh, glow up, like every time she sips a coffee, there's a slurp sound. And all the other ding-dong boings, the inserts of memes, uh, the uh, cut-ins to her when she's editing. I don't think you nearly give editing AP physics, uh, Emma, nearly enough attention. I feel like... There's this separation between um, the comedian and like uh, like like Mr. Bean, right? Rowan Atkinson, or like um, Charlie Chaplin, or uh, like uh, um, Chauncey Gardner, um, who is played by the guy who was in Pink Panther. Um, you know his name. I forget his name. I think his name was Peter Sellers. Like, all of these men are bifurcated between their Lucy, Lucille Ball domestic life versus their, hey, Lucy. Um, uh, I mean, you can see that in the recent, um, the recent documentaries on Lucille Ball. There's been a number of them. You can even see it on the recent documentaries and uh, fictional biographies of Elvis and also of Marilyn Monroe. You can see that there is a very shrewd business person behind the public persona. That is my biz biggest weakness, is that I don't have a shrewd Chris Abraham. I just have this one. I do not have uh, the, the shrewd planner who mind maps or um, creates a, uh, a criminal mastermind map of photographs and words stitched together with red twine or a uh, red string or uh, red yarn. I am, I am, I am what I am, and that's all that I am. I'm Popeye the Sailor Man toot toot. So, for example, today I found out after knowing that Mark Harrison, my business partner, best friend, and sailing buddy, and the man who oftentimes picks up my life without me even knowing, uh, I realized uh, after knowing that he had lived in Mauritius uh, off of Africa um, near... Um, uh, anyway, uh, he lived there for years. And, and even though I'm like zoology boy and I know a lot about the dodo bird, I didn't know that the dodo bird lived exclusively and only on Mauritius. And that's why um, the, the complete extinction of the dodo bird only lasted 100 years because the dodo bird, like Hawaiian, uh, like the beautiful Hawaiian, I guess they're sapsuckers, the beautiful, beautiful Hawaiian sapsuckers that thrived in Hawaii and, began, and became very much like the uh, diverse uh, specialized finch species of of um of um darwin uh his exploration in the galapagos uh those became those thrived because they didn't have any natural predators and when even the native hawaiians moved in and in addition to them killing the birds in order to create their elaborate elaborate um ali'i which is the hawaiian word for king capes the you know, elaborate headdresses and capes made of the fine feathers of these uh, sap-sucking birds in beautiful yellow and red plumage, while uh, what really killed them was the introduction of rats, and then later the introduction of mongoose, and um, with the rats taking over, uh, and, the, and the dogs, and the pigs, and everything else, these little, these little beautiful undefended birds are are and have gone ex are going and have gone extinct as a direct result of invasive species there was nothing uh after the you know the spanish and portuguese and the dutch and everything else after they went ahead and they uh 
invaded Mauritius and brought with them dogs and rats and people and pigs and so forth. The defenseless, completely defenseless and fearless. That's another thing about uh, making girls as fearless as dodos. One of the dangers of making girls as fearless as dodos, thinking that they don't have any fear in a world based on uh, hero worship and, and, and movies like the movie Sniper Grit, the movie recently where a little five foot two Japanese kung fu expert could take on 10 adult men. Uh, I've had a number of five foot tall girlfriends, and honestly, I could throw one across a room. So no matter how much aggressive Krav Maga like force multipliers uh, using Brazil- Brazilian jitsu jiu- jiu- or, or, or judo, or any of the other kind of things that, that you know, even very muscular five foot six women might be able to do. If you don't get them in the, in the balls or in a very sensitive spot like the eyes or the neck, um, you're going to have a very hard time taking down an adult male. I'm not talking about the cute little adult male you're dating who is exactly the same size and shares your genes. I'm talking about 300 pound, uh, six foot three me, uh, so, like, uh, and that's what I fear for Emma Chamberlain. I'm sure she has security, and she has talked about, uh, about people stalking her. But, like, that level of fearlessness is what made the dodo extinct. It had no fear. It had no memory of danger. It had no understanding of situational awareness. It didn't, it had long ago given up its ability to fly or swim. Uh, it was just a... It didn't even run. It, was, uh, it wasn't stupid, but it didn't have any fear. Like, uh, I feel like growing up in Hawaii where, like, uh, local brothers and uh, mokes were always scaring the bejesus out of me and saying things like, Oh, bro, you like beef. What? You like beef. What? You think you cool. What? You think you bad. I feel like that kind of external stimulus m- drove my uh, uh, tendency towards aggressiveness tendency towards uh, too quick escalation. Uh, maybe my spider sense is too uh, too well honed for someone who's as big and now as old as me. But uh, I see a lot of people, I saw a lot of people growing up going to Punahou and Iolani, generally Howley kids, who would just get beat to shit because they just didn't have any situational awareness and they didn't associate a stinging, uh, a st- stinging barb of their words to automatically result in a beating by five cousins uh, on the streets of like Kahuku or even like downtown or whatever. Like it's a extremely interesting thing. Um, so yeah, so I asked Mark today if I could make his new nickname Dodo, which is funny because uh, in French, the saying Metro, du- Metro, uh, what's the trend? Metro Bulo Dodo, Metro Bulo Dodo means uh, commute, work, and sleep. So Dodo means sleep. And I don't think Mark sleeps anymore now that he's working uh, for, he's married and a loving husband with a beautiful wife. And he also has to work. He also has to work in the uh, uh, time zone of, of Sydney, Australia. So I don't think he ever sleeps anymore. And he is very handy at defending himself. Uh, there's a story that I believe I've embellished to the point of, of, uh, of fiction. But my story is that he tells a story of being on the metro of Spain or Portugal or someplace. Uh, maybe. Yeah, Spain or Portugal or something like that. And uh, he was on the metro, le metro. And he, the, the train was coming. And a guy tried to pickpocket him. And according to the story of Mark, or according to my fictionalization to make it completely rock star, uh, Mark savagely took the hand, the arm that was trying to, that was trying to uh, pickpocket him and uh, broke it, like broke the hell out of it. Like, like literally, I think elbowed or twisted or like cracked it in half, like a full break. And then calmly walked into the into the opening door of the ma of the metro and and uh and just sort of rolled away rolled away 
So uh, into the night, not, in, not needing to be accountable to the brutal arm breaking of a common criminal who was only, according to today's narrative, he was only doing that so as to get a, a bit of bread. Alexa, stop. He was only doing it to get a bit of bread. He just, he just needed bread for his family. And the fact that Mark would brutally destroy this man shows what an ungodly terror he is in the entire world. So, uh, and all that is completely my embellishment. I don't know if any of it is true, but it is extremely, I'm in the apartment now and I am hereby putting my phone into my Hill People Gear brand kit bag. This one I have on me now and I'm putting my keys back in. One that I have on me now is uh, a limited edition because they released it and realized that they completely made every mistake. And so they had a big discount on it. And, uh, and uh, I still own it. And what the mistake was is that Hell People Gear kit bag is, is like primarily designed, primarily designed for concealed carry so that you can carry your firearm on your chest if you're packing in the woods. And an important part of it is your ability to kind of rip the is unzipper or rip the case open in a very fluid manner and then be able to very quickly uh, draw your firearm and shoot the bear. And uh, apparently these number 10 zippers, these YKK big beefy cool looking zippers uh, really have a hard time with that. They uh, don't do well with that at all. So, so it's uh, highly amusing to have it. I mean, this isn't... I don't conceal carry at the moment, but uh, they went ahead and they uh, reduced the size of the zippers down to the much smaller ones that they've always used. But this one is big, beefy, kind of hard to open and close, but really good looking, tough, will last forever. And this is their first foray into the medium size bag. So it is bigger than a snubby and smaller than a full size. And it is, it looks like a runner, because it's got like two zippers, but it also has PALS uh, Molly kind of webbing in front. So it's kind of got a tactical thing. And I have a, I don't know if you can hear that. I have the runner's like elastic thing that goes around my body to keep it tighter against myself. So, so it doesn't flop around. Hola, que tal? Muy bien, gracias. Hasta mañana. Ciao. So, like I said, this is Season 7, Episode 1, and this is an extended episode. It's not even interesting. Someone's here. I'll shut up for a second. Hey. Yes. Ciao. <laughs> All right, so the I don't know if I still have the uh, I still have the AFib. It's really annoying, you know. And uh, the thing about having the AFib, I know what happened. I had uh, I had breaded spicy chicken wings, and even though I ate them early in the evening, I also put uh, sriracha on them, and that resulted in kind of a tummy upset, and that also resulted in. Uh, some, uh, what is it called? Um, uh, when you, uh, when your stomach acid, acid reflux. So I got some acid reflux and I got some st tummy upset and I had kind of a bloated little tummy wummy and all that stuff when I went to sleep kind of just conspired to pop me into AFib and it didn't go away on its own overnight. So I am going to chillax today. I mean, I fully intend to do uh, at least to do 10,000 meters on the erg tonight, but I'm not going to do any, uh, I'm not going to do any, uh, any power 10s or power 20s. I'm just going to collect as many meters as my big old terrified body is willing to accept some um, que sera, sera. I wonder if people in Napa or in Italy or wherever. I wonder if they ever, I wonder if there's a wine called K Shiraz Shiraz or K Shiraz Shiraz in terms of the Syrah grape. There must be a K Syrah Syrah or just K Syrah 
Uh, whatever you drink, you drink. If you drink too much, you will stink. K Sarah, Sarah. What you drink, you drink. Until you are a drunk. Da -da -da -da. Oh, God. So I blame the badness of this episode. I blame it exclusively on uh, the AFib and the general sadness that makes me feel and all the other fun stuff in the world. And uh, what else? Uh, nothing. Nothing. Don't tell anybody, but I picked up off of eBay, I picked up a black, black 500D uh, GORUCK GR2 40 liter because I realized that I can't schlep everything that I want in the world in this one bag. It's perfect for what I have in there, but it's actually pretty limited, the GR1 26 liter. It's perfect for what I have it for, but when I want to carry around my uh, Alpha Smart or my Freerite or whatever, I don't have room for that. I don't have room for groceries. Like, there's just not, like, a lot of stuff room. You know, when you go traveling and you realize that when you're finished with your trip that you have a bunch of tourist trap bullshit or you've bought clothing or you've bought gifts for people and you don't have any room for it in your bag. So you need to either buy a bag or you need to go to the post's office and mail your dirty clothes home so as to create space for that. That's what's going on. So inshallah, like the extra 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, the extra 14 liters will be open for business. And I assume, j'espère ça, that the height of the bag, since I am a tall guy with a very long torso and short stubby legs. I'm assuming that the length of the bag, the height uh, against your back, the length of the back of the pack, I assume that that's longer too, which is fine because I've got some extra room above my flat white man's ass. Um, and I just assume that there'll be a lot more space and I'm thinking about testing it and then sending it off to Scars so that I can have it custom made to my my personal requirements such as cinch straps and handles and drainage grommets and i don't know what else uh and then i need to find out if i can use if if uh custom ruck has a uh kydex frame sheet that i can buy i keep on sending them emails and i never hear back from them i should do a search they might go all the way to my spam I should do a search to see if they uh, already were in there. Um, yeah, I'm so bummed today. Today was not the best day to do the first episode. I need to only do episodes when I'm feeling all wiggly. Like things I'm thinking about is uh, thinking about, you know, the, the nature of the selectiveness, the political selectiveness of what is a, uh, an ethnic cleansing, you know, a, uh, a uh, what is a Holocaust because... Nobody ever talks about the 5 million people that have died as a direct result of America uh, invading Yemen, Syria, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Iraq. Nobody talks about that. Nobody talks about Tigray. Nobody talks about uh, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. Nobody talks about uh, the Uyghurs. Nobody talks about any of these things. And from my friend who was uh, deployed to Kosovo and Sarajevo during that ethnic cleansing. Nobody talks about whether or not it's going to happen again in Kosovo between uh, the Muslims and the other Muslims and the Christians. Uh, nobody talks about other countries. Nobody talks about the Kurds and those ethnic cleansing and, and those genocides and those holocausts, right? Like it's very targeted. Nobody's even talking about the genocide or ethnic cleansing or whatever of um of ukrainians in ukraine and nobody has ever talked about the ethnic cleansing of russians in ukraine before then so it's very much a selective thing it's very much decided in order to uh pull heartstrings and direct people's focus um i feel like if you talk too long about genocides and holocausts and ethnic cleansing uh at some point people build too much of a tolerance and uh 
and they don't hear it anymore. You know, for example, the Uyghurs or the non-Han Chinese or, you know, uh, of course, you know, especially the Jews, right? Like uh, the Jews have been talking about the Holocaust and their, uh, their, their right to exist for so long that like, it's just like the Uyghurs and the Kurds. Nobody pays attention anymore. Um, nobody remembers the Kosovo war. Nobody remembers any of these things. So in many ways, like, I think that we know exactly how long it takes, uh, victim, uh, Holocaust, genocide, equity to be fully utilized. It's 85 years, right? 80, 90 years, 85 years, maybe it takes. Who knows? From this. I hate to be transactional, like as if, like, you know, Holocaust, genocide, equity is even a thing. But uh, it feels like the entire world is trying to become uh, the biggest victim and the most protected species. And I feel like, uh, as we all know, the only way victims are, are become non-victims is if the victimizer, victimizer decides to take moral uh, and ethical and financial and fiscal responsibility for that behavior. In other words, all DEI, all ESG, all, uh, all support of minority groups, all support of LGBTQIA+, all support of trans rights, all support even of, uh, of minority rights and Latinx rights and Pacific Islander rights and uh, African American rights and, and uh, Jewish rights and everything else is completely done at the pleasure of the dominant culture. It's only through their commiseration and their collaboration that any of these big changes could be made, which is why, uh, oh, what's her name? Jesus, uh, I really, I forget her name. Uh, I will find out. Alright, according to ChatGPT, uh, this is uh, manifest perfectly. And this is even true because we're seeing that people are taking down Black Lives Matter, they're taking down BLM, they're taking down DEI, they're taking down ESG, they're taking down uh, trans rights. They're like dismantling all of the uh, pro-minority, pro-protected um, species, pro-protected pro communities. They're taking it all back. They're, uh, the, the, the powers that be have developed enough uh, tolerance. That's the funny thing about tolerance, right? You can build tolerance for something and you could build tolerance against something. So the quote is, uh, the master's tools will never dismantle, dismantle the master's house, is a notable work written by Audre Lorde. I studied her in college. It was awesome. Oh, come on. It is a collection of essays that explores her experiences of black lesbian mother and discusses the intersection of these uh, aspects of her identity in the context of white patriarchy. Uh, this work emphasized the importance of emotions and desire and challenging desires and challenging systems of oppression. Full quote. Let's see if they do it. The full quote is, wow, it's not quoting anymore. It's uh, shut that down for reasons of IP. Ah, oh, asshole. Let me ask Google. Full quote. Here we are. For the master's tool, for the master's tools will never dismantle, dismantle the master's house. They may allow us temporarily to beat him at his own game, but they will never enable us to bring about genuine change. Come on, Audrey Lord. That is the truest thing ever said, right? Like there is temporary change, but the moment it becomes uncomfortable for Whitey or for dominant culture, Western culture, or capitalist culture, or patriarchal culture, or anti-revolutionary, 
anti-communist, uh, anti, anti-Western culture, the moment it becomes uh, intolerable is the moment uh, all rented property, all squatting property, all of the beautiful once, all of the people in the rough with their tent cities become even mildly inconvenient, even just for a visit from uh, President Xi, even just for a little bit of inconvenience, even for when the guests come around, even for a millisecond, if all of the uh, looting, all the lawlessness, if that ever becomes intolerable to the system, you will be surprised how much, how many resources. You'll be surprised how quickly situational temporary martial law will be used by, at a federal, state, or local level. You'll be surprised how little power you have because all your power is at the pleasure of the president. So it's completely simulated. So you need to get your own tools, you need to get your own house, and you need to take the power of the house away from the master. Because as long as you're dicking around with the master's tools, you will still be a slave to the master. So realize that tolerance is a two-way street. You can bid build tolerance for, and you can definitely build tolerance against. So intolerance is a thing, and intolerance is a powerful thing. And uh, if you use the concept of the white blood cells, or if you even use the concept of chemotherapy, or if you use the concepts of a change of lifestyle as a way of defeating what's considered a cancer in the main corpus, and you stop thinking of yourself as the healthy flesh and think of yourself as the cancerous flesh, because maybe that's what, you know, Blackstone and Blackwater and <clears throat> Wall Street, Silicon Valley, they don't want anything that you're selling them, maybe except hip hop, I don't know. But uh, it's sort of like, uh, like the way I put it, and I hate to say this because it sounds so condescending, but I think there's a quote from 1984 or Sun Tzu or, or someone it's really great. Might even be one of the uh, one of the Greeks or the Romans. But the quote is something like uh, a quote might be something like uh, you need to uh, one of the great ways of giving everybody complete freedom and complete access to behaving every way they want and completely not being fettered by any mores or mores or uh, strictures or laws or uh, protocols. And by giving everybody the freedom to fly their own freak flag, you thereby give them carte blanche to completely reveal they are who they are in public for everybody to see. Instead of trying to figure out what's going on in the darkness of a of a uh, of a library basement in person, or the back of a smoky cafe in person, or you give people the kind of liberty to let their freak flag fly, and then you can completely uh, make notes. You can completely make notes. And what the notes do is they say, okay, uh, Chris Abraham is a complete edgelord uh, on Mastodon and a bit of a troll on Twitter and uh, a, uh, a little bit of a challenging git on Facebook, but we've never seen him protest anywhere. We've never seen him show up in a in a, at a meeting outside of the Freemasons and Trinity Episcopal Church. Um, he's never been arrested. He's never protested. He's never uh, looted. He's never burgled or robbed. All right, that's what we know about him. Um, and then everybody will be like that, right? Like everybody will be like that, especially with tools and AI and all of the uh, intelligence tools. There's going to be an infinitely larger number of uh, Malcolm X slash um, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, FBI files based on all y'alls and all my alls and all our alls uh, antisocial behavior, especially since we all thought that all of our antisocial behavior was done uh, righteously. It's done for the climate. It's done for black lives. It's done for Palestine. But, you know, I mean, there have been lots and lots of people who have been jailed and killed 
as a direct result of climate activism, climate terrorism, um, environmental terrorism, like just because you have a righteous, uh, be, just because you have a righteous reason for being antisocial doesn't mean, and even if the state tells you that it's perfectly okay to behave that way, like it's not something that I would necessarily believe is a long-term solution um, because at any moment the tables can turn, right? That's why everybody's so freaked out about Trump maybe winning the election, right? What, what will Trump do with all of that delicious, like what will Trump do with all that delicious info about how you behaved during the Biden pre presidency? Or even what about how badly uh, Trump and his administration could react based on how you behaved during Trump's first presidency, right? Like everything has a double-edged sword. And if you've done the, you know, if you've done the meditation and you believe that, uh, hola, and you believe that uh, it's all like worth the struggle, then go for it, man. Fighting the power is like a beautiful thing, but also you don't get away with murder forever, right? Like they're going to be, look at how the, look at how the uh, Biden White House and look at how the Democrats in Congress, look how viciously they arrested and sent 840 some people to jail time uh, for a riot that didn't include any guns, didn't include any knives, didn't include any billy clubs, didn't include any shotguns, didn't include any AR-15s, didn't include any Glocks, didn't include any uh, Molotov cocktail bombs, it didn't include any fires, it didn't include a burnt down. The only person who died on site was, uh, was one protester, a vet, and uh, she was shot, shot in the face through a door. It wasn't even a situation where the uh, federal uh, cop was in any personal threat. He, li he literally shot her in the neck through a door and killed her. And uh, I forget her name. I hate that I forget her name. Um, oh, Ashley Babbitt? Ashley Bobbitt? Ashley Babbitt? I don't know. Doesn't matter to me. It's just bullshit. So, I mean... The only reason I'm talking about it is because it just happened a couple days ago, and uh, the like they're doubling down as as uh, trying to make this into something that is as bad. Uh, and they're also saying things like Trump said, "On the first day of my presidency, I will be a, a authoritarian or a despot or whatever." When in fact he said on the first day, uh, "I will only be an authoritarian or a despot or whatever for one day, and that will be to." Uh, close the borders and drill, baby, drill, drill, drill. So they turned it around to, um, on the first day, I will be an authoritarian on day one, or whatever he said. I have a hard time remembering the exact word. It's not authoritarian. It's not totalitarian. It's not despot, something like that. So it's just like um, they lied about what happened down in uh, UVA. Like he never did say uh, there are, you know, fine people on both sides or there are are bad people on both sides or anything like that. The the quote was much longer and it doesn't matter. Like uh, Frank Lentz always says is, uh, it's not what you say, it's what people hear and I will extend. Uh, it's not what you say, it's what people hear and believe and remember. Because we all know, maybe we all don't know, but it's well known and documented that Russiagate was a complete hoax, manufactured hoax, not even a mistake. And as a result, to this day, which is uh, January 2024, there are uh, innumerable people who still believe that Russiagate was real and piss tapes were real and uh, Trump is a Russian asset is real and all that other stuff. So like there's no like like I like like one says to the pregnant woman, uh, sorry, you're not I can't unfuck you. So I guess you can unfuck someone. I mean, that's what that's what abortion is about. But you know what I mean? Like, you can't unfuck somebody. Um, there's a lot of propagandic bouncing babies that are completely healthy. And one of those is January 6th. The other one is that Trump will be, be an authoritarian. The third is that if Trump wins the election, the democracy will end as we know it. And these are being said again and again and again and again and again. And, uh, 
I dare say that there are probably a lot of Russian trolls, as they're called, who are going out there and saying things like, I would love an America that was run by someone like Franco or like Mussolini or like, you know, Hitler or whatever. Like there's a lot of people out there on the extreme right or people pretending to be extreme right who are fomenting this uh, support that Trump's base is actually really into a uh, future of uh, strong man despotism and authoritarianism. And uh, I think it'll work. I think we even have uh, news actors. We even have news actors who are crying about January 6th and crying when they're interviewing January 6th police and crying about January 6th. And uh, if people are that committed to cry on, on national TV, sobbing tears over uh, something that was even less violent than that, uh, that kid who shot like a bunch of, uh, a bunch of protesters in, uh, in one of those BLM riots, BLM protests, it's his name. Like there wasn't even that. There was promises of guns, there was promises of bombs, there were promises of pipe bombs. But if you're like me, an unexploded bomb, it's like Schrodinger's bomb, right? There's no bomb unless the cat dies. You can only throw people in jail when cats die. And there are very few dead cats as a result of January 6th. So with my mixed metaphor and my confusion with regards to it, howdy. Like, I really don't know what to say, so... But this is a really long episode, and for that, I'm really sorry. But uh, thanks for walking with me. This is uh, hopefully making my AFib feel better. My tummy certainly feels better. My knee, I'm still kind of gimping, and it pisses me off. And uh, we'll see. Maybe moving to Jacksonville will be just the thing I need. Who knows? Maybe uh, after three months at TJ Fitness Center plus... Planet Fitness plus rowing erg at Shea Chris of 10,000 meters a day. Maybe the magic lubrication of modern love and constant movement and full range of motion and the building up of support muscles in my quads and T-zone? That's on your face. T, T-band? Anyway, all those things. Hopefully that will help knee pain because I feel like knee pain can be, you know, suffering from uh, deteriorating knees, but it can also be the result of your muscles, tendons, and bones not getting enough full range of motion and strength love. Anyway, on that note, I hope you're well, and I love you, and this is Chris Abraham show, episode one of season seven, and I will talk to you soon. Aloha and mahalo. And day heba is Thank you for listening to The Chris Abraham Show. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Until next time.